this is the Sunday closest to the Jewish high holy day of Yom Kippur, arguably the most sacred and important day of the Jewish year. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. It is a holy day for seeking to atone for one's mistakes, to repent for one's misdeeds, and to pledge to turn in the direction of more faithful living so that your name might be reinscribed in the Book of Life in the coming year. Yom Kippur is observed seriously, solemnly, soberly. And each and every year, the scripture reading for Yom Kippur is the entirety of the book of Jonah. I've always found this somewhat striking and surprising because I have trouble taking Jonah seriously. It doesn't seem to me to be a solemn and sober text. In fact, how I've read it has always been kind of in the, the joyful spirit with which our community singers just sang about it, right? So I've always thought that this choice of a text clashes with the serious mood of the day. Now there are, there are obvious reasons why Jonah is the scripture reading for Yom Kippur. The book of Jonah is the story of a reluctant prophet who turns away from his calling, from his duty, from his responsibility. It's the story of a prophet who turns away from God, but then is turned back, toward, turned back towards what is meant for him. And more than that, Jonah is the story of a God who does not turn away from us. God does not give up on Jonah. God does not give up on Nineveh either. God does not give up on us, despite our mistakes, despite our disloyalty, despite ourselves. It is a universalist text. And on that sense, on that level, Jonah fits with Yom Kippur. However, on another level, it has always seemed to me to clash with the seriousness of the day. Jonah has always struck me as an absurd comedy. A little goofy, a little silly, and let me count the ways. Jonah begins with God telling Jonah to go from Joppa, present-day Joppa in Israel, which is on the coast of, of Israel, to Nineveh, which is located in present-day Iraq. Jonah responds by going down to the port and getting on a boat headed for Tarshish on the Spanish Riviera. God is displeased and causes a massive storm to descend upon the boat. The sailors try rowing away from the storm to no avail, and eventually they come to realize that their voyage is being divinely cursed. At this point, Jonah comes clean to the sailors, and he begs the sailors to save themselves by throwing him overboard. The sailors try to avoid doing so, but then reluctantly agree. Jonah is cast overboard, the storm recedes, and a large sea creature immediately emerges from the deep and swallows Jonah whole. All of this action takes place in just the first chapter of Jonah. And Jonah is, it's a very short book, it's just four chapters long, but that part of it is just the first quarter of the story. The second chapter contains a prayer, a prayer that Jonah offers during his three-day journey inside the fish, and it ends, there's only one point of action on the, in the second chapter, and that's the fish spitting Jonah out onto dry land. We're halfway done. The third chapter finds Jonah reaching Nineveh. It is a large city, a three-day walk from one end to the other, and so Jonah walks the length of the city, telling the city's residents that they're sinful and they've angered God and that the city will be utterly destroyed in 40 days. And the city listens to Jonah. The king, the king finds Jonah persuasive and orders everyone to repent. And it said that everyone in the city, everyone in the city puts on sackcloth, covers themselves in ashes, and fasts. Not only that, but the text describes how the animals, the cows and goats and sheep, are made to wear sackcloth as well, and have ashes put on them, and the animals fast. 
Let's just pause for a moment right here and acknowledge that in all the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible, this never happens. The prophet is never universally embraced, the message heeded, the commandments obeyed, except in Nineveh. In Nineveh, the entire city heeds the warning of the prophet, and God sees all this and decides to spare the city from judgment and destruction. This, however, is not the end of the story. We come now to the fourth chapter. Now, how many people are familiar with the story up until this point? People know. How many people know that there's more to the story, that there's a fourth chapter? Some hands, fewer hands, fewer hands. And that's because the fourth chapter doesn't get the attention that it deserves. The fourth chapter is actually my favorite. So after God spares the city, Jonah turns into a whiny brat. He goes out into the desert, stomps his feet, sits down in the hot sun, and sulks and pouts. He is mad that God spared the city because it made him look bad, made him look like a bad prophet. But he's pouting and sulking. And so then it gets, then the story begins to get a little weirder. God sends a plant and causes a plant to grow up over Jonah, and the plant produces a large gourd, and the gourd provides shade for Jonah as he sulks indignantly. <laughs> and the gourd makes Jonah happy. But then, God sends a worm, and the worm crawls up the plant, eats the gourd, and the plant withers, and Jonah gets furious all over again. He cries out, I am mortally angry. I should be better dead than alive. And God replies, you get to be concerned about the gourd. I get to be concerned about the city of Nineveh with its 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. <laughs> and it's with the word animals that that is the end of text, the end of the book. Jonah. That's the end. Let's, let's pause here for a moment. What's your response to this story? What's your reaction? What does it bring up for you? For you? That's the question I'd like you to sort of ponder just a little bit. What is, what's your personal reaction to that story? As I said earlier, my response to Jonah has always been one of kind of amusement at the sheer absurdity of it, getting on the boat to Tarshish, cows and goats wearing sackcloth and ashes, Jonah sulking like a petulant child as he sits in the desert, the worm eating the gourd and Jonah crying over his gourd, and that doesn't even take into account the journey in the belly of the whale. But I wonder, now I wonder, if I haven't misinterpreted this story all along. I want to suggest that there are three main times in the story where we, the hearer of this story, are supposed to look at Jonah and ask ourselves whether we might see a little bit of Jonah in ourselves. The first point at which we might look at Jonah and ask if we've ever been Jonah, have we ever felt like Jonah? is at the beginning, with when Jonah runs away. Earlier in the sermon, I joked that he was headed for the Spanish coast for a nice vacation, but one source I consulted said that it would be better to think of Tarshish as representing the end of the known world, the end of the world as it was known to the Hebrews 3,000 years ago. Jonah is not only running away, he is running to the ends of the earth. And to ask, have you ever felt like Jonah, is to ask if you've ever run away from something. If there's ever been something in your life that you've run away from or avoided. 
Have you ever avoided doing what you knew you should be doing? What have you run from facing? Have you ever felt like Jonah? Have you ever avoided something because it was uncomfortable or because it was scary? And if we ask that question of ourselves, then the text might become a little more meaningful. The second time we might ask whether we've ever felt like Jonah is during his three days in the belly of the whale. This is such a rich and powerful image. It's a story that's not meant to be taken literally. And actually, it might help us to know that in religious traditions the world over, there is a recurring theme of religious figures, gods and mortals, being swallowed up and closed in a dark place for three days only to emerge later changed. This trope is found in Sumerian mythology, and some scholars believe that Jonah was written aware of that Sumerian mythology. This trope is found in some Native American myths, as well as some Eskimo myths. It is a theme that's found in Zulu traditions, and obviously in the Christian tradition, in which Jesus spends three days in the tomb. Have you ever felt like Jonah? Have you ever felt swallowed up in the dark, not knowing where you're going or how you'll get there or if you'll get there? Have you ever felt not in control? I read a story about a Jewish congregation that last year changed their own Yom Kippur tradition. They held their afternoon Yom Kippur services, the afternoon services at which the entire book of Jonah is read, they held them not at the synagogue, but they actually rented out the Natural History Museum in town, where they set up their chairs underneath the immense whale skeleton hanging from the ceiling. Who's been to a Natural History Museum and seen the, you know, the 46-foot whale bones? And they read the story of Jonah looking kind of out through the whale's ribcage. Isn't that neat? There are times when we might feel like Jonah, when we are not in control, when we're waiting on the results of a medical test, we're given a challenging diagnosis, when there's someone in our life making choices and we can't force them to choose differently, when the storms come, and we find ourselves at the mercy of what we cannot control. And there's a third place, a third place in the story where we might ask ourselves whether we've ever felt like Jonah. And that's at the very end of the story, where Jonah sits righteously in the desert, sulking, pouting, cursing God, demanding vengeance. I went looking, as I prepared this sermon, I went looking for Unitarian Universalist sermons about Jonah, and I found some that were about the fleeing, the, the fleeing from what you should be doing. I found quite a few about how to, that metaphor of being in the darkness, in, uh, in a place you can't control for three days, but I found only one, only one, which was about the end of Jonah. In the winter of 2003, as the United States was on a trajectory towards war against Iraq, the famous and influential UU minister of all souls in New York City, Forest Church, preached a sermon in which he cast George Bush in the role of Jonah. He referred to Bush as a childish Jonah figure sulking in the desert, who would rather die than see Nineveh go unpunished. A prophet so determined to find vengeance that was blinded to all else. Then when he was criticized for preaching politics, Forest Church responded by quoting Mahatma Gandhi, who said, those who say religion has nothing to do with politics do not understand what religion is. And it's this part of the story it's the end. I told you that the end, the last chapter, is my favorite. It is also 
the hardest. It is also the hardest chapter, and it's that place where Jonah moves from, from kind of comedy into tragedy. The tragedy, not the destruction of the city, but the tragedy of a figure who is so set, so focused, so determined to seek vengeance, so self-righteous. It is set on a course, despite all the destruction of it. And so if we're going to ask ourselves if we've ever felt like Jonah, we might ask ourselves, have there been those times in our life where we have felt so set, so set on things going one way that we found ourselves unable to see all that's around us in the fullness of it, to see all that might be. Have you ever felt like Jonah? Have you ever fled from what you knew you should be doing? Run away from responsibility, fled to the ends of the earth to avoid something hard? Have you ever felt swallowed up in the dark, not knowing where you're headed? Have you ever felt that things were out of your control? Or have you ever sat in the desert, suffering stubbornly in the sun because things did not go your way? The world is moving on, but you cling, you cling to your own sense that things ought to have been different. I close this morning with those questions and also a poem, a poem by the Islamic Sufi mystic Rumi, who offered these thoughts on Jonah. Rumi wrote, Sometimes people don't see the signs that are so close, even how their homes are unlit. The way you're living now is like living in a tomb. There's none of God's light and no openness. Remember that you're alive. Don't stay in a narrow, choked place. Your Jonah has cooked long enough in the whale. Have you forgotten what praise is? Amen. Blessed be. And let us sing our closing hymn this morning. It's in the teal hymnal, Blue Boat Home. And I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing.